Welcome back, everybody. We are here for our final panel of the day, very large panel with an exciting theme. So this panel will talk to you about zooming in on changing wildlife habitats and at quite a wide variety of spatiotemporal scales. Laurel will be up first. Okay. okay, so this is for our intro. So this book is called Death Comes for the Archbishop, and it's about the intersectionality of European colonization in the southwestern United States and the impact of drought. And I chose this book and this quote to show for my introduction because it takes place during my study region's time period and during my study region's area and a through line for all of our projects is looking at how land cover change and climate change affects habitat. Yeah, we know um, that wildlife habitats are changing um, all around the globe, but to focus specifically on sagebrush habitats, um, we, we know that it's changing and specifically we're losing a lot of it. Uh, 1.3 million acres of sagebrush habitat are lost every year for the last 20 years. Um, Colorado has lost 20% of its sagebrush habitat since the 1950s, and that stat was put out in the 90s, so we've surely lost more than that. Uh, Gunnison sage-grouse and sage-grouse obligate species have lost 90% of their historical habitat, and uh, these are mostly driven by uh, increasing human development and land use changes. So what's the result? We have uh, around 350 species in the sagebrush ecosystem listed as conservation concerned species. And the other major habitat in the Gunnison Basin and the West as a whole are forest and similar to the sagebrush habitat, fire, climate change, insects, and land use change have impacted all of these systems. Um, and, you know, if and how these systems recover remains an open question as we heard in the panel earlier with uh, wildfire and forest. So dipping into the world of amphibians, because this affects everything as we know it. Um, so at least 43% of all amphibians, amphibious species are experiencing population, de population declines as of 04 with the IOCN's Global Amphibian Assessment in 2008, showing that 32% of all amphibian species are threatened or extinct. And then an um, alarming statistic that just came out in 2020 was uh, 2.9 billion birds have been lost in North America uh, within since 1970. Um, so within the past 50 years um, from 2020. Um, and about 30% of that is Aralind bird species, which are common in our, or which are the bird species present in the sagebrush around us. Um, and a lot of this is due to uh, climate change and, um, and land use change, so habitat loss. Um, so yeah, these are each, uh, each factors that we're gonna be touching on in our research. Um, and to begin with, we'll start off with Laura, uh, Laurel talking about pollen and how it uh, can tell us about the past um, vegetation and climate. Okay, my project is climatic reconstructions in Western North America using the ratio of Ambrosia to Artemisia pollen. And first, I would like to thank my committee, Dr. Hannah Carroll as my advisor, Dr. Sasha Wright, and Dr. David Marchetti for all their amazing help and support throughout this project. So my project is focusing on paleoecology, which is the study of past ecosystem dynamics. And it can do really cool things like reconstruct past vegetation and climate. Like this is what, oh, sorry, it's not working right now. I'm sorry, I'm just laser pointing people. Sorry, Front Ranger, Colorado. Okay, so 
for my specific project, I'm using pollen and I'm doing that because it's found nearly everywhere. And it can be very indicative of vegetation composition and source community because you can do really cool things like make pollen diagrams. And we'll be getting to that in a minute. So first what you do is you take a pollen core and going back in time, we can look at, so each of these is a little time slice and we can look at the vegetation composition within that time slice using pollen. And how you do that is you make a pollen diagram like this. So the pollen core would be like these lines here. And so you can see the relative abundance of each taxa within this pollen core. Okay, one specific um, pollen diagram is one that can reconstruct the settlement horizon. So the settlement horizon is a really clear line in the pollen record when European colonization occurred and you, it can be marked by a huge increase in certain taxa. So switching gears slightly, pollen ratios can tell us about past climate because certain taxa can be very indicative of certain climatic conditions. For example, the ratio of ambrosia to artemisia pollen because ambrosia really likes summer precipitation and artemisia really likes winter precipitation. So they react oppositely and this allows for the tracking of precipitation. So the driving questions for my project are, is the ambrosia to artemisia ratio applicable in Western United States to undergo precipitation and other climatic reconstructions? And specifically, what bioclimatic variables drive the ambrosia to artemisia ratio? Okay, my study area is EPA level one ecoregion six and 10. So this is this dark green Northwestern forest mountains and yellow North American deserts. And these ecoregions are really great for studying um, different climate interactions spatially because they allow for the interaction of bioclimatic and environmental variables to be more apparent. Okay, I used the Neotoma Paleo Ecological Database, which contains over 38,000 data sets and, and various paleo proxies for my pollen research. Okay, so this is my study area and I implemented a two decimal degree buffer around the study area for all pollen rain and dispersion. Okay, so this is my study distribution. So a major thing we need to talk about really quick is how I mentioned that the settlement horizon can be marked by an increase in pollen and one of those taxa is ambrosia. And so papers have found that before and after the settlement horizon, ambrosia cannot be treated as an analog. So what I did is I implemented a correction factor for each ecoregion to account for this by calculating the median increase in ambrosia from before and after settlement. So this is for our surface, so after settlement, and we can see a pretty strong north to south gradient of an increase in our ratio. So this is for our um, fossil pre-settlement samples, and we can see the same thing. Okay, so I use bioclimatic variables from the World Clim database, which have a variety of different climatic metrics. So I mentioned pre-settlement, I picked the Little Ice Age as a pre-settlement area because it is very well studied and we know a lot about what the climate was like then. Okay, I z-scored all of my bioclimatic variables, but I also included elevation, latitude, and longitude, but I did not z-score those. The purpose of z-scoring is to allow for meaningful comparisons when your data have different scales. Okay, I use generalized additive modeling, which allows for the modeling of immensely nonlinear data such as mine and the combination of interactive and additive effects. So what I came up with was the cold deserts, Mexican high plateau and Western Sierra Madre Piedmont located in these areas had a statistically significant increase in ambrosia from before and after settlement. So we found that the mean diurnal range, temperature, seasonality and precipitation of the warmest quarter were the most influential bioclimatic variables. So this is my reconstructed for the Little Ice Age annual um, temperature variation. So what we did is we split it into three data sets. So this is only ambrosia and artemisia in this data set has been recoded to a dummy value because none was present. And so now we can see there is an increase from north to south 
of our temperature variation, but in our modern samples, it's actually the opposite. And we have a bit of a data gap where we don't have quite as much. So for our no art ambrosia, only artemisia, we also had a north to south increase, but this time it was for mean diurnal temperature range, which is the mean of the maximum minus the minimum temperature. Finally, our precipitation of the warmest quarters. So this was when both real tax, um, real proportions, I'm sorry, were present and there was not any dummy value. And in our reconstructed for Little Ice Age, we had a more south to north increase in um, our precipitation, but in our modern, we actually had the opposite. And again, we're just missing some data up here. Okay, so you can see what's interesting about this is that there's all these different colors kind of separated out, which tells us that we're going to possibly be able to reconstruct at a very fine scale our bioclimatic variables, depending on what area we're looking at. Okay, so again, this was our no artemisia. We have our north south gradient, and all of these are very um, broken apart, which is really what I want you to take out from this. So finally, what we found is that the ambrosia to artemisia ratio is in fact applicable in the Western United States to reconstruct various climatic variables. We found that temperature mostly, and in fact, temperature variation was one of the most influential predictors. And this was different from other regions such as the Great Plains. Thank you so much, and I'll not take questions. Awesome, thanks for that. What questions do we have from the audience for Laurel? Ah, where did you get your data for the Artemisia and Ambrosia? That's a great question. So, yes, I didn't go into that very much. So I did use the Neotoma Paleoecology Database, like I very briefly mentioned, and it is a large-scale community curated database that has many different types of pollens. So what I did is I just um, downloaded about 150,000 data sets that were found within my region. And then I pulled out the Ambrosia to Artemisia samples within those. So I only downloaded um, data sets in which at least one taxa were present. Does that make sense? It's a massive data set. <laughs> Next question. Mm -hmm. What did you find to be the most challenging aspect of your research? Um, my my own not doing things well. <laughs> As her advisor, I'm going to argue against that, but please continue. Um, the most difficult thing was that pretty much every other day I would be looking through my code. And I was like, yeah, do, do, okay, we're going, we're ready for the next step. And then I was like, no, I'm not. I did something very wrong. Um, <laughs> time to redo a bunch of it. So it would have gone a lot faster if I had um, been better at coding. She's really good. <laughs> Next question. Mm -hmm. Is it common to use these taxa for climate analysis? And are there other species that researchers use for this same type of information? That's a great question. So that's actually kind of what we're looking at. So there are different taxa that can be used for climate analysis. And the caveat to most of them, though, is that they're very spatially specific, as in they only function within certain habitats or certain ranges of precipitation. However, in 2013, Christopher Morris found that this ratio was applicable across the entire Great Plains region to distinguish between tall and short grass prairie very accurately, which is pretty amazing. And then this work is following up the work of Dr. Hannah Carroll in 2020, who found that the erosion artemisia ratio was applicable across the entire Great Plains for precipitation reconstructions during the Little Ice Age. So I kind of forgot what the question was, but um, your an the answer is that there are other ratios, but this is one of the potentially most widely applicable. And is it common to use these particular taxa for climate analyses? Um, no, because... It's new. Next question. How do you think these findings will be applied in other areas of research? 
That's a great question. So one of the goals is to create another way to reconstruct what the past was like so that we can have better hind casting models. So hind casting is when um, climate scientists want to reconstruct what future climate will be like, but they base their models on how climate changed in the past. And so the more data we have about what climate was like in the past, the better potential future modeling can be. All right, thanks very much. Thank you. Oh, and now Megan will talk about climate modeling on habitat um, suitability. Awesome job. Oh, I have also not used the pointing. Here we go. Perfect. So Tim made these amazing zoom in features. Very helpful to help demonstrate where we are. So uh, like I said, dipping into the world of amphibians and for my MSC project, we were working on predicting distributions of high alpine amphibians in the Southern Rocky Mountains. So pretty briefly, what I wanna talk about today, species of interest, uh, the, the present data that I'm using, for who? <laughs> um, the species distribution models that I'm making and what are they? How do they work? What's the point of them? And the predictor variables that I'm using, which are actually really similar to what Laurel's using, my very preliminary results, I should preface this talk with, I'm not done yet, um, working on it still pretty hard, I would like to say, and um, acknowledgements at the very end. So like I said, species of interest right now, I am working on boreal toad data here on the left, and then eventually we'll obtain data for these other two listed coarse frogs and tiger salamanders. And I got that data from a US Fish and Wildlife 2017 report and from uh, GBIF, so online sources. And really broadly, so a species distribution model, SDM, as I will call it from now on, it's really long. Um, you start off with your species occurrence points, so where are they? And I think Rachel touched on this earlier. It's really hard to know where they're not, right? Because they're also a really cryptic species. They're brown and green and live on the ground. Really hard to see when they're, when they're not there. Um, it's hard enough to see when they are there. So you take your species only data for, for my specific model, and then um, you add your environmental predictors. So like I said, pretty similar to laurels. So uh, climatic predictors and uh, things like land cover as well. I'll go over those little, a little bit later. So you add those things together and then you get these pretty maps. <laughs> um, so predicted suitability, so suitable habitat that uh, is predicted by, by your models. And I should have mentioned, uh, there are many ways to use an SDM. Specifically, I am using it to predict suitable habitat for these three species um, in the recent decades, and I'll talk about that later, and then in the future in uh, 2050. And so, yeah, uh, we have our location data right here. That's my, my map that I'm proud of. And then I'm adding in my predictor variables. So. Right there on the left is uh, growing season length for uh, 2013. That was my first preliminary model that I've made. So I just wanted to demonstrate a little bit more what I'm working with. So those are the types of maps that I'm looking at. And then on the right here um, on the X axis is elevation and on the Y is bio 10. So which uh, correlates to uh, the annual temperature of the warmest quarter. So roughly translates to how hot is it in summer. So generally higher the elevation, the colder it is, right? And I don't have um, actual numbers for this, but it's something more to keep in mind as you're using these, these layers, um, as you're creating your models to find out if they have any covariance, if there's any correlations within your data. So, um, and if, there's, if they're too strong, potentially get rid of them. And then moving on to the type of model I'm using. So within the world of SDMs, there are many ways to do this. The one I chose to do is MAXENT, which stands for maximum entropy. So really, really broadly, it's trying to add together a very homogeneous distribution of your animal, of your species of interest, and then your, your predictive variables that you give it. So it's trying to kind of merge those two things and give you a habitat suitability map, which is, there's a lot of things to it. Um, and like I said, pretty broadly, uh, you take, you extract the values to begin with, you extract the values of say, you know, your, your toads are here 
here and here, and then you have your 11 variables that I'm using. So you have a value of that variable at each location point for every location point. So it ends up being a lot of data. So you extract those values and then within maxn it averages those values to figure out, okay, so the toads like this temperature, this humidity, let's see where else is similar to that within your study site. So that's pretty broadly what I'm doing with that. And then on the right here is a uh, multivariate environmental uh, suitability surface maps. Uh, these are, from what I understand, a little bit less for your results and more for, for understanding what's going on with your data. So right here on the bottom, um, I have snow cover days. I don't know if you can read the, the titles, but those are some of the variables that I'm using. Um, so yeah, snow cover days. So you can see that um, a lot of this is pink because that's North America. And these, these are just showing you how different other areas are. So in the top left, you can also see the ocean is green. So that's just demonstrating to me that the uh, the variables in those areas are much different than my area of interest. So where all of my points are kind of congregated, that's how different those other areas are. So maybe when I'm looking at, at my results, I can see, okay, that's why we're not predicting over there because the area is very different. And then when you start making your models, you can mess with them, which I've started to do. Um, and this is called parameterization. So you can use something called feature classes and a regularization parameter. And I won't get too in the weeds of it because it's, it's pretty intense. Um, but the feature classes just apply these different, these six different functions to each layer that you give it. So my 11, um, you can apply, you know, a linear or a hinge function to your data to, I think of it as um, to allow Maxent to look at your data from different perspectives so that it understands and can fit your model a little bit better. And then to prevent overfitting on the other side, there's something called a regularization parameter. And it does just that, keeps it from being so fit and so strict on where the toads could be. So then after you've messed with those values, you, you should evaluate your model. And I won't get too into this either, um, but on the bottom left, there is uh, something I've made for cross-validation. So on the top left box, that'll take like number one, and then it'll use that as like your training data, and then it'll test with the other ones. And then it'll take the next box, use that as your training data, and use the other ones as your testing, just to make sure your models fit really well. And then you can do a few other things like area under the curve. I think we've all probably seen a graph like that before. And like I alluded to earlier, these are my climatic predictors, and you'll probably see a few that are similar between our two studies. And the two that are bolded, fire severity and land cover type, are two that I don't have quite yet, making some progress with the fire severity, so that's pretty exciting. And then um, on the bottom right here for my, because I've made a very preliminary model so far for 2013, uh, these are the variable contribution values. So you can see bio 11 up top there. So that is the coldest, or the cold mean cold temperature of, uh, I'm sorry, the mean temperature of the coldest quarter. So basically how cold is it in winter? And then um, at the bottom, which is contributing the least is bio one. So the mean annual temperature. And that just, again, like tells you which, which, predict or which predictors are most important in your models. And then same on the left, but on the right, that is my first model for uh, 1988 with my location data on top of it, just to help me and hopefully you visualize to see what's going on with the data. And then, so moving on with what I'm doing, um, I'm moving towards doing decadal time steps. So from 1979 to 1988, 1989 to 1990 or 2000, um, if I counted right. Um, so do four time steps, because that's how much data is available to me, and do those in, in a decade chunks. So this is my first decadal time step. I haven't combined these together yet, but this is what I have so far. And um, so I'm hoping to combine all 40 years of data to make those decadal time steps to help show how the habitat suitability has and is changing through time, given climate change, because I'm using climatic predictors. And I stole this from a different paper, Becker et al. 2020. 
And obviously they're studying blue whales, but I think it's a really good way for me to visualize how mine might look. And their habitat suitability, like the best habitat is in yellow. So you can see that from left to right, the suitable habitat is shrinking, right? As we all know. So I'm thinking that that's my, that might be what I'm going to see. And then uh, once I get all, all 40 years, all four time steps, then I'm gonna go to 2050 into the future to see how it's expected to change then too. So that is that. And then um, for my acknowledgements, thank you, Derek, for being my advisor and being awesome. And to my committee, also Derek, Madeline, and Leland, if you were able to zoom in, thank you. And then special acknowledgement, acknowledgements to Hannah. Um, very, very helpful person, it seems like for everyone. And then um, <laughs> data sources and funding sources, mostly through the school. All right, don't forget to submit those questions. Bring on. So first question, do you have, uh, or I'm sorry, why are you evaluating these three specific amphibian species versus other species? Sure, sure. So we had first started looking at boreal toads given their endangered status within Colorado, just to try to better understand how their habitat is changing, right? Because they're, they're important to us. Um, and then we had to switch to a little bit broader of a picture given the lack of, of local data given to us. Um, so we tried, we expanded to encompass all three species too, again, like make it a bigger picture and, and um, kind of smooth over our lack of really specific data, if that makes sense. All right, next question. Do you have point data for all 40 years or are you using one data? I don't know that I understand, I'm sorry. Can, you? Can we um, clarify the point data question? I mean, I'm using raster layers for, for each of the 11 uh, climatic variables for each of the 40 years if that helps a little bit. And then when I extract those values is kind of, I still wouldn't call it point data. They're just extracted values, so. So um, using the 2017 USGS, uh, or sorry, US Fish and Wildlife Report, and then um, other data from GBIF, which I haven't actually checked exactly uh, the, the time scale for when people have submitted the data on GBA. It's a really good question for me to look into further. Take a time scale. Okay, next question. Based on your preliminary results, did you find more changes within one decade versus another? Sure, I can just move back to it. Um, it might be a little bit hard to see. And I mean, you can see a little bit of change. I haven't done any... Um, any analysis on these data yet. So I just got them like last week, but you can see a little bit of change. Like there's a little bit less green right around there, right? But when I was looking at this, it does seem like the green areas are pretty popular. Um, I'm not seeing any drastic changes. I'm not really surprised with what I'm seeing so far, but again, this was, so if I can nerd out for a minute, in um, 89, so just after this year is when everyone started to notice they couldn't find their their amphibians anymore. So I I would expect that there would be some change in here because around this time, all the herpetologists around the world are like, hey, I can't find them anymore. Like, what is going on? So something is happening here, right? If if this is around the time when, when that was starting to be um, well known. Great. Um, in addition to habitat variables, could you source data related to how vulnerable these three species are to chytrid fungus? So chytrid fungus, oh, nice question. That's not something we're really looking into because chytrid fungus is, you could do an entire SDM just on that. Like it's, it's spreading like mad and it's really unfortunate and it's around the world at this point. Um, so it's something we chose not to include just it's, it's all their project, to be honest with you. Um, and we know that boreal toads are very susceptible to, to pitchered fungus. Um, and then given their, 
their status in Colorado. And then um, there are also not just chytrid, but there are also like bee cell and, and things that are affecting the other two species. Um, so it's a huge problem and, you know, beyond the scope. <laughs> Are the ecosystem requirements similar for these three species? Oh, that's really good. Um, so everything, I should have addressed this. Uh, everything that I spoke about so far, the the predictors that I chose are for boreal toads. Um, I'm sure, I, I don't wanna be sure, going into researching which climatic predictors and I'm gonna use for the other ones, um, I like to keep an open mind. So with boreal toads, we, we do know that um, Snow cover data is going to have a big uh, say on on where they can can't be, and I mean that probably will have effect an effect on the other two. But I do like to do research on each one of them to make sure that I'm picking picking variables that are pertinent to that species. So probably, but I don't I can't say for sure if that makes sense. And last question: Are any of the three amphibian species shifting habitat more or less than the others? And if so, why do you think that is? Uh, so I, I don't, I don't have results for the other two yet. Um, so I really can't answer that at this point. Um, yeah, I mean, this is all I have, I guess, um, so far in my project. Um, we do, given given that the boreal toads are. Uh, declining in numbers here in Colorado, um, I would anticipate that boreal toads would lose more habitat suitability, at least here than the other two. But that's, again, just me guessing because I don't have anything to back that up. All right, thank you. And I'll turn it over to Tim. <laughs> Yeah, so my focus is centered around the Southern Rocky Mountains. Um, I'm gonna be talking to you today about a portion of my thesis, which is looking at un ungulate resource selection and bark beetle impacted forests of Colorado. Um, so just some background, anyone that's been in the Gunson Valley, the Southern Rocky Mountains, or really the West as a whole, I'm sure you've seen bark beetle outbreaks. These outbreaks deviate from historic norms because of anthropogenic changes to the landscape and the climate, whether it be fire suppression or climate change. Um, this has increased the duration, severity, and extent of the outbreaks, which has altered the forest structure, composition, and potentially its future trajectory, all of which have impacts on the species that rely on conifer forests. Uh, just to give a bit more context for beetle kill. Uh, so bark beetle is probably about the size of your fingernail, um, and they operate through pheromone media mediated mass attacks, where a huge swarm of them will attack the same tree, bore into the tree, and if they're able to overcome the defenses of the tree, they'll create these kind of uh, tunnels, which, and then lay their eggs, and the life cycle continues. However, as an unfortunate consequence of this, um, these tunnels cut off the nutrient flow for the tree and result in its, in its eventual death. Um, this has impacted over 6 million acres of forest in Colorado and significantly more across the West as a whole. Um, so just to give a visualization of what 6 million acres looks like. So this is Colorado, and this is the progression of beetle kill from 1997 to 2022, um, with the darker shades of orange representing a higher severity of beetle kill. To orient you a little bit, right here, the Gunnison Valley, and then this map extends south to New Mexico, north to Wyoming and west to Utah. And then here's kind of the front range. Um, and so as you can see, a huge amount of impact of beetle kill within this area. Uh, however, beetle kill isn't a monolith. Uh, the look of a forest that's been impacted by beetle kill varies significantly by age. So we have this first stage, which is after they've been impacted, but largely still look healthy. Uh, and then two to five years after the initial outbreak, we have what's called the red phase, where the needles turn red, but they're still on the tree and the tree is in the process of dying. Then five to 15 years after the initial outbreak, we have what's called the gray phase. And at this point, the tree is dead. All the needles are off, but the tree is still standing. And then in the decades following an outbreak, uh, we see the trees begin to fall and this regeneration of the understory as seedlings and saplings begin to establish. And the cycle kind of continues. Um, they also vary significantly by severity. So here we have a forest that probably 
10 to 20% mortality, but as we can see, a lot of healthy trees still on the landscape. And here's a photo by near Lake City that shows probably you know, upwards of 70 to 80% mortality. And obviously these forests look and act very differently. They also vary significantly by patch size. So here we have an example of just a few trees that have been impacted. Whereas here we have this really landscape level, high severity impacted area. And finally, they can vary a lot by heterogeneity. So here we see a pretty even distribution of mortality. It's probably about 40% mortality across the entire landscape. Um, heterogeneity can also speak to isolated patches of impacted forest in a larger um, unimpacted ecosystem. And then an example of high heterogeneity is where we have these impacted patches within a broader uh, healthy ecosystem. And so all these forests act really differently and presumably the species that rely on these forests will also act differently. Um, for the, my research, I'm focusing on two species of ungulates here in Colorado, mule deer and elk. Um, they utilize forests predominantly in the summer. So that's where my research is focused on is their resource selection in the summer months. Um, these forests provide forage, protection from predators, and as well as thermal protection. However, it's not really well defined how they use areas that have been impacted by beetle kill. So this leads to the research, my research objective, which is investigating the mechanisms by which outbreak severity, heterogeneity, age, extent, all impact ungulate resource selection in Colorado. So how do we go about answering this question? Well, first we have to know where the individuals are. So luckily Colorado Parks and Wildlife has undertaken an extensive GPS collar trapping effort. So we have the known locations of a huge number of individuals. So for mule deer, we have data on over a thousand individuals with over 700,000 known locations from 20, 2004 to 2022. For elk is a similar story with over 600 individuals, 600,000 known locations spanning almost a decade from 2013 to 2022. We also have to know what the habitat that they're in looks like. And so there's been huge efforts undertaken by the US Forest Service, the Colorado State Forest Service, as well as a huge number of researchers using remote sensing data to quantify the age, severity, patch size, and heterogeneity of the outbreaks. And we combine this data in what are called resource selection functions. So I'll just walk you through really quick what resource selection functions are and how they work. So it's an approach used to understand species habitat use by comparing points that are used to points that are available on the landscape but are not used. And this allows us to determine if resource is used being used more, less, or in proportion to its availability on the broader landscape. And then we can use stats. I use the same generalized additive models that Laurel used to determine if these habitat characteristics vary significantly between these used and unused points. Just to give a visual rep representation of what this would look like. So imagine we have an environment, we have these known locations of our species of interest, whether that be elk or mule deer. And using these known locations, we construct a home range. And so we see that everything inside this home range is available habitat. They are able to go to this habitat. And so on this available habitat, we put a bunch of random unused points. So these points are what are considered the available points. And then for each of these points, both the available and used points, we extract our covariates of interest. So whether that be the severity of the beetle kill, the time since the outbreak began, or the heterogeneity of the outbreak. With this data, we then compare these metrics of the used and unused points. So in this toy example, we have elevation, and here we have the unused points, and here we have the used points. And from this, you know, we could say that the used points have a much higher average elevation, and so they are choosing areas with higher elevation as compared to where the general landscape as a whole. So they prefer higher elevations on the landscape. With this basis, um, kind of want to dive into the results. So Kind of first, just establishing some, some basic facts. Um, both the deer and elk select for forested areas. Again, this isn't surprising based on what we know about the ecology of these species. So this is them choosing between area that isn't forest and a forested area. If we look specifically at forest and just ask, are they choosing forests that have been impacted or healthy forest? We see that they generally avoid forest with beetle kill present. Um, but this doesn't really get at the question that we are wanting to answer, which is, when they are in beetle kill forest, what characteristics are these species selecting for? So to get into that, um, we'll go, go through some of the figures that we made through our research. 
um, to orient you all, it'll be the same for all of these, but on the y-axis here, we have what you can call selection. So anything above this red line means that they're selecting for that habitat characteristic. Anything below means that they're avoiding it. So starting with severity, we see, starting with severity and starting with mule deer, we see that they're selecting for these really high severity patches. So this is like upwards of 80% mortality we see them selecting for. For heterogeneity, we see them kind of selecting for these low to moderate heterogeneity areas, and then at really high heterogeneity, they're avoiding these areas. For patch size and years since outbreak, we really see that kind of flows right around that zero line, which means no selection for or against, meaning that these mule deer aren't really selecting for or against these factors. It, it doesn't really make an influence where they choose to be. Going now to elk, we kind of see the similar pattern with severity, where at really low severity, they're avoiding these habitats. At really high severity, they're choosing to be in those habitats with really high severity. With heterogeneity and patch size, we kind of see these kind of strong patterns, but not really well-defined, uh, whether they're choosing for or against these habitat traits. And then finally, for years since outbreak, we see a really low year since outbreak. So just after the outbreak occurred, they're selecting for these habitats. And then 15 to 20 years after the outbreak has occurred, we see them start to avoid these habitats. So does this make sense? Well, I guess to summarize first off, um, mule deer select for areas with higher severity beetle kill and low to moderate heterogeneity, whereas patch size and age since outbreak has little impact. For elk, we see, again, this higher severity and more recent outbreaks with little um, pattern for heterogeneity or patch size. So do these results kind of make sense with what we know about mule deer and elk? Um, and why may these patterns be occurring? So for severity, um, the literature suggests that in areas with high severity, there's this release of the understory vegetation. So they become a valuable food source at really high severity. Um, this is for, really supported in elk because elk are, brow, are browsers, so they are grazers. So they traditionally eat grasses and forbs on the forest floor, whereas mule deer are traditionally browsers eating the seedlings and saplings. And we see that in areas just after the outbreak, centering normally around five years after the outbreak, is when there's a high release of grass and forb cover in these areas that have been impacted. This also correlates to when we see this highest jump of selection for areas um, of beetle kill. So it's suggested that areas with high severity provide this really valuable forage source for mule deer and elk. In terms of heterogeneity for mule deer, um, this is possibly indicative of areas that are surrounding areas of beetle kill that are surrounded by large areas of unimpacted forest. As I mentioned earlier, the uh, both these species prefer areas that haven't been impacted by beetle kill over forests that have been, been impacted by beetle kill. So perhaps they're using these beetle kill areas, but really like when they're surrounded by areas of healthy forest because of that protection from predators or that thermal protection that these healthy forests provide. So kind of what does this all mean? Um, so bark beetle impacted forests pose a huge risk to uh, wildfire, and so managing them is an important uh, part of, of how we can mitigate these wildfire risk. Um, if we care specifically about mule deer and elk, we could target our management strategies towards lower severity, older outbreaks. As uh, important to caveat this with there are many other species that use forested habitats, some of them high priority species like lynx. And so it's important to manage the ecological needs of all species that utilize forest um, areas when deciding how to manage beetle kill. Um, but these management strategies could take the form of prescribed burns or salvaged timber harvest. Um, and another important thing to remember is that healthy forests are preferred over impacted forests. So all management should be aimed towards uh, directing forests to healthy mixed age forests, which are you know, the ideal habitat for all of these species. Um, with that, I would like to thank my advisor, Madeline Vanderkirk, my committee members, Kevin Blecka and Jonathan Coop, as well as all the wonderful folks I got data from that about which this project wouldn't be possible as well as my funding sources.
Right, thanks. Be sure to submit those questions. Um, so several rolling in already. Um, first question, to what extent do you think your findings are coincidence versus ungulates intentionally choosing these particular bark beetle kill conditions? Yeah, I would say I feel pretty confident that these are active choices. So how this works is for every known point, we select on the landscape 100 random unused points. So we can be pretty confident, uh, especially with the size of the data that we have with over you know 700,000 known locations for mule deer and 600,000 for elk that, you know, we are really able to pick up on these fine scale differences in selection. Again, we, yeah, with the amount of data that we have, uh, we could be pretty confident that any difference that we see is pretty significant um, just because of the, the scale of the data that we have. Um, yeah, and it makes sense again, with the previous research and the understanding of the ecology, these results kind of fall in line with that. So that I think that further supports that these results are pretty pretty reliable. Great. How did you get data or determine the data for the severity of the beetle kill? Yeah. So like I said, there's a lot of people working on this. Um, the one that I used predominantly was the research by Kyle Rodman um, out of the University of Northern Arizona. Um, and he has done a lot of work with remote sensing to um, determine you know, which remote sensing uh, metrics like NDVI or and any of these other metrics are good at good predictors using ground truth data. So they have areas where they know they have the known severity of beetle kill and use that to inform a model and predicting it based on these Landsat metrics. Uh, and so, yeah, it's a pretty reliable model. Again, there's a huge amount of work that's gone into, into understanding beetle kill and its progression um, throughout this region because it is a huge, huge issue. Yeah, and along those lines, is there any correlation between the severity and the age since outbreak or time since outbreak? Uh, that's not something that I've specifically looked into. Uh, it would be interesting in that I know, you know, 2008 in this region was kind of the the pinnacle of of bark beetle expansion. Uh, so it'd be interesting to see, you know, if that also was not just a factor of the the area, the acreage impacted, but also the severity. Uh, I think that's something I'm going to incorporate into future models to see also like an interactive effect between severity and a lot of these other metrics um, to see like if the results are amplified um, in more severe outbreaks, but that's not something that I've looked into specifically at this time. Next question. Are methods aimed at preemptively reducing bark beetle kill working? And if so, what are the most successful methods? Yeah. Um, I mean, I think, you know, efforts to, to mitigate and have worked. I know there's the pheromone packets have been uh, largely implemented in areas when I think the success has been pretty decent. I think it's also important to note that bark beetles are a native species. They're not an invasive species. Bark beetle outbreaks are a natural part of the ecology of these forests. Um, as I mentioned, they've certainly been amplified by even age forest and fire suppression and climate change, which has increase the survival of these species, but I don't think that it's fair to view beetle kill or bark beetles as the enemy. I think they're a natural part of these ecosystems and managing them and getting them back into their natural cycles is an important thing, but you know, eliminating them um, is not, not the solution either. Do you think that the results of your data could impact hunters' opinions of beetle kill? I do in some ways, I mean, it definitely could inform, you know, what is, is good habitat. And maybe, you know, if the hunter's goal is to have a habitat that promotes, you know, healthy and uh, populations of, the, of these animals, you know, obviously uh, research that any research, research that informs that will, I think, be, be to their benefit. Um, I haven't thought a lot about like how they are using this information directly. I know there was a paper a few years ago that looked at, you know, if these areas with a large amount of tree fall act as refugia for deer because hunters aren't willing to to navigate those areas. Uh, so it definitely is some some interplay that also exists within just like the practical practical context. Um, but yeah, definitely something else to look into. All right. Let's thank Tim again. Yeah.
And with that, I'm gonna hand it over to Liam, who's been looking at grazing and sage grouse. Thank you. Yeah, hi everybody. Thanks for being here. Uh, my name is Liam Dugan. I'm here to talk about a research effort that's been going on over the last three years where we've been monitoring the effects of livestock grazing on U.S. Forest Service lands in Gunnison sage grouse habitat. I started this work three years ago as an MS ecology student here at Western, graduating this May. And in the winter of last year, 2022, I was hired as a wildlife biologist for the Forest Service here in Gunnison. So I'll be speaking kind of wearing both of those hats today. Um, federal land management agencies are tasked with multiple use mandates. And in this story, that includes the conservation of wildlife habitat while also providing a space for agricultural food production, in this case, in the form of uh, beef cattle on public lands. Now, these two uses may not always be in alignment with each other, as livestock are thought to remove herbaceous vegetation through grazing, thereby reducing sage grouse's ability to hide from predators. And they may do this to such an extent that they have a population level effect on sage grouse, and this is of great concern. So what are we concerned about livestock altering? We're concerned about vegetation structure, which we'll define as the three-dimensional shape of vegetation across time and space. So these photos are meant to signify the wide range of vegetation structural characteristics where we, which we find Gunnison sage-grouse habitat within the basin here. Uh, federal land managers also require quantifiable land health characteristics by which we can uh, measure the the impacts of our decisions. And so we use the Gunnison sage grouse habitat guidelines to these goals, which are an acceptable range of vegetative structural values, which signify a healthy Gunnison sage grouse habitat. These were compiled in 2006 um, from the best available science at the time. And they detail things like sagebrush cover, grass and 4% cover, sagebrush height and grass and forb height. So now we have to go out and monitor some habitat. We used a monitoring framework uh, created in 2012 um, in a document called the Gunnison Sage Grouse Candidate Conservation Agreement. Um, a bunch of federal uh, and state wildlife and land managers within the basin here got together and drafted a monitoring protocol which requires monitoring to occur in every grazed pasture with sage grouse habitat on federal lands. And monitoring should take place before grazing occurs, after grazing occurs, and again at the end of the growing season. So how do we collect the data? We use a widely accepted method called the line point intercept method, which is pictured here as a 25 meter in length tape measure that's strung out across the sagebrush. Um, and we collect percent cover along the transect using a pin flag, which we drop at systematic locations along the length of the line. Each time we drop this pin flag, we record what type of vegetation comes into contact with the pin. And we can count all of those up and get something that looks like this, the percent cover for shrubs, grasses, and forbs. We also measure vegetative height using a 12 inch in diameter measurable zone pictured here as these yellow circles. So the tallest shrub, grass, and forb within these circles um, are subject to have their heights measured and recorded. And we can find those mean values which may look something like this. So who is this, uh, who, who's involved with this research pr process? It's a partnership agreement uh, between Western Colorado University and the US Forest Service. This began in 2021. Um, what is it that we set out to do? We wanted to meet the monitoring intent of the candidate conservation agreement to monitor before grazing occurs, after grazing occurs, and at the end of the growing season. Um, where did we do this? We did it across 80 grazed pastures in the Gunnison Basin, an area uh, accumulating approximately 80,000 acres. Um, we established one monitoring transect per pasture and, um, and completed a total of 277 line point intercept transect readings. And why did we do it? Well, our research-oriented goals were to investigate the effects of livestock grazing on sage-grouse habitat, and our management-oriented goals were to ensure that U.S. Forest Service lands are meeting these Gunnison sage-grouse habitat guidelines. So after conducting this research for a year, we, we started noticing some potential limitations with these methods in terms of measuring actual hiding cover for Gunnison sage-grouse. 
Um, one example can be the way that we measure percent cover. Percent cover is taken from an aerial perspective. So picture yourself as a bird or a satellite uh, flying over the land, looking down at the land and classifying the land into uh, different, uh, quantifying how much of the land is being covered by these different vegetative classes. So for this example on the right, um, we have a landscape that's dominated by shrubs, or I'm sorry, by forbs and grasses at a percent cover around 25%. Um, but when we pair these measurements with height measurements, we find that inevitably some of them are too short or the, below our sage grouse habitat guidelines for height and therefore cannot be used as functional hiding cover. So we know that this method is likely overestimating usable hiding cover for Gunnison sage grouse. Another potential limitation is the way in which we collect heights on the transect. We use a method called uh, droop height which measures the tallest individual leaf blade of any shrub, grass, or forb. So for this example on the left, that would be delineated as here at 27 centimeters. But we know that this is likely little use as functional hiding cover for a sage grouse, considering the relatively small surface area that a singular tallest leaf of grass provides. Um, so for this example, we would prefer to measure functional hiding cover here at 15 centimeters at the, the greater mass of, of this individual uh, plant, but uh, standard methods, you know, enable us to only use droop height. Um, so again, we know that droop heights are likely also overestimating uh, usable hiding cover for sage grouse. So we wanted to incorporate a method which would uh, collect percent cover and heights at the same time and to do so in a way that is measuring functional hiding cover for a sage grouse. Um, so we use the Robel pole uh, to estimate hiding cover. It's pictured here. Uh, the way it works is observers view uh, the Robel pole from a standardized distance and height and record how much of the pole, how many of those red and white bands are obstructed by vegetation. Um, we believe this measures functional hiding cover for sage grouse um, better than the line point intercept transect values do. And we paired uh, this method with, of Robel transects with um, all line point intercept transects. Uh, so that we could compare between the two methods. Now, another potential limitation with the way that we collect data on a line point intercept transect is that only the tallest plants present have their heights recorded. And so here we have two measurable zones that are full of grasses of different shapes and sizes, but the only ones that can be selected for height measurements are the tallest ones present. So that would look like this. Um, we know this is an obvious bias because uh, we, when we present means, we're presenting means of only the tallest plants that are present on the transect and not a random sample of the population. So we set out to solve this problem by randomly sampling on the transect. Uh, we used the pin flag that we dropped for percent cover. Um, in this instance, we have a grass that is hit by the pin, and we would immediately record that as a random sample. Now we, we recorded random samples in conjunction with recording uh, the tallest individuals present at 188 transects total. And this gave us a very robust comparison uh, to compare uh, heights between these two methods. So what did we find? We used paired Wilcox tests, uh, testing the effective sampling method, whether it was the tallest or the random uh, way to do that on shrubs, grasses, and forbs. And we found statistically significant results um, for all vegetative life classes, indicating that the tallest method for sampling heights is overestimating mean heights by 2.7 centimeters in shrubs, 7.3 centimeters in grass, and 3.4 centimeters in forbs. You might be thinking, well, what's the big deal? 7.3 centimeters isn't that much. Well, the tallest method for height sampling is used across the country in the BLM's assessment, inventory, and monitoring strategy. It's, it's very common. And now we can say that they're systematically overestimating grass heights by around 7.3 centimeters. Uh, here on the Gunnison Ranger District for 26 transects readings, uh, whether or not um, uh, our, our grass heights met Gunnison sage grouse habitat guidelines was determined by what height sampling method we were using. Um, really the key takeaway with this is that grass heights alone are not appropriate indicators of Gunnison sage grouse habitat and that the sage grouse habitat guidelines are likely uh, vastly oversimplified. Um, what about our livestock affecting the vegetation structure where we measured? Um, we found almost 
no effect of, of livestock to change the vegetation structure over time. In green, we have our before grazing mean range-wide grass heights. In red, we have after grazing uh, grass heights in blue at the end of the growing season. Using an ANOVA, we found no statistical difference between these. And I say almost no change because we did find statistically different change in one metric that we measured, which was 4% cover. This isn't surprising though, considering uh, by the time we're collecting these end of growing season measurements, it's middle of October and most forbs are dried out, desiccated and may not even be there. Um, again, we found no change in vegetative structure uh, through time using the Rebel cover method. Um, but we did want to ask which plants are contributing most to Robel cover. So we use generalized linear models to model the effect of all the variables that we collected on line point intercept method. And we found that all, all of these variables of shrub height, grass height, forb height, and percent cover of those vegetation variables are uh, uh, increasing Robel cover. But when we threw those into a model selection framework, we found our top model to be an interaction between uh, shrub height and shrub cover. And this isn't necessarily surprising considering every time we viewed the Robel pole, we recorded what type of vegetation was obstructing the pole and shrubs were obstructing the pole um, almost 90% of the time. So what does this all mean? Well, we can say that current levels of livestock grazing do not seem to affect vegetation structure where we measured. And I say where we measured because livestock distribution is really uneven across large complex uh, landscapes um, with the majority of livestock use occurring in lowland riparian areas. Uh, it's important to note that moving forward, we will be establishing transects in these riparian areas to monitor livestock use in these habitats. Um, this effort, however, was focused on upland sagebrush communities or sage grouse nesting habitat. Um, these communities do appear stable on short timescales. And we can also say that the majority of sage grouse nesting cover is provided by shrubs, a vegetation class that is relatively untouched by livestock grazing. So with that, I'd like to say thank you to my committee members and all the people that helped me in the field. This uh, project was funded in entirety by the US Forest Service. Uh, this video that you're watching is a group of around 70 sage grouse flushing from uh, the sagebrush habitat that we as a university manage behind campus here. Um, so it's maybe proof to those who maybe thought that those habitats weren't important that uh, maybe you're wrong and that it is. So uh, yeah, thanks and I'll take any questions. All right, so first question. Do you see an increase of cheat grass in these heavily grazed areas? Um, I don't know if I've correlated it with heavily grazed. Uh, the Forest Service is really lucky to have um, overall higher elevational habitats than uh, like our partners and neighbors on the BLM. So the Forest Service is uh, lucky to have a lot less cheat grass because of that, although it is coming and we're noticing it more and more. Um, I just don't know if I've noticed it in relation to the disturbance that might be caused from grazing. Um, there's a lot of work being done on, on, on that level in terms of trying to get weed treatments going and that sort of thing. Great. Next question. Uh, could you incorporate methods from the ecology of fear literature, like incorporating topography to look at how prey species perceive the hiding spaces? Yeah, that's an interesting question. Um, you know, the the way that we were testing vegetation structure was uh, with the Robel pole. And uh, the height at which we were re reading those Robel poles was around 50 centimeters off the ground, which is the height of an average coyote's perspective of the world. So we were looking at habitat in terms of um, maybe mammalian predators that use scent and sight, um, but there's more to be done in terms of quantifying sage grouse habitat from aerial predators. And, and the biggest one that I can think of is, is ravens right now. Um, th those populations have been exploding. Great. Any other questions for Liam? All right, let's thank cool. him again. Thank you. Up next, we have the main event.
Alrighty, so zooming into the Gunnison Basin, um, thank you all for sticking around uh, for this very long forum, but uh, thanks for sticking around to see what I have to say. All right, so for my research, I did investigating environmental drivers of brewer sparrow density in the Gunnison Basin, uh, which is a spatio-temporal analysis of habitat characteristics. So a little background, um, as Liam had kind of touched on at the beginning of all of our presentations, um, the sagebrush step is a, or step two Ps and an E at the end, um, is an important ecosystem of the American West, and it supports many unique bird species as well as um, many important vegetative species and uh, other animals. Um, it's historic range of 62 million hectares, which is around 153 million acres, um, has halved, and um, this is mainly due to energy infrastructure, urbanization, um, development of roads, um, and then greatly due to invasive plant species um, encroaching. Um, and then species that rely on this habitat, because of this uh, habitat decline, species that rely on this habitat are also suffering. Um, and so bringing this uh, this back up from the beginning, but yeah, since 1917, 70, uh, nearly 3 billion birds have, um, have been lost due to this habitat decline. Um, and then for arid limb species, it's about 30%. So um, this is my species of focus called the brewer sparrow. Um, this is a little brown bird that is uh, commonly known as the, um, the sound of the sagebrush sea. Um, and I wanted to give you all a little excerpt of the sound of the sagebrush sea. If you go out anywhere out in the Gunnison Basin um, into sagebrush, you will 99% likely um, hear this bird. But yeah, here it is. Yeah, so that's the that's the brewer sparrow. Uh, it is a very long song. It has a very uh, loud voice for how small of a bird it is, but um, it is important across the sagebrush ecosystem, and it's one of the most uh, one of the most abundant uh, in the sagebrush sea around us. Um, it is a migratory sagebrush obligate bird, so I will refer to uh, sagebrush obligate birds um, throughout this presentation, and that just means that it is um, it requires sagebrush habitat for every single part of its reproductive cycle. Um, and then it is migratory, so it uh, migrates down to the southern part of the U.S. and into Mexico. Um, and it nests in center of sagebrush shrubs, um, not too close to the ground, but not too high to the crown. Um, and it experiences popular or it's experienced population decline between 25 and 50 percent within the region, um, and that's the southern Rocky Mountain region. Um, and a lot of the known knowledge of the brewer sparrow is uh, kind of focused around sage grouse, not the harsh on sage grouse or anything, but um, sage grouse have been historically used as a, an umbrella species for studying um, other sagebrush species of birds. So um, they'll study sage grouse and um, and kind of apply that to other sagebrush obligate birds, whereas um, sometimes we need a little bit more information about these other species. So um, just to touch briefly on this, this is a this is not a uh, brewer sparrow, this is a green-tailed toey, this is another sagebrush obligate bird that we'll see uh, around here. But um, just to briefly touch on this, benefits of uh, finer scale study. So my, my study is focused solely in the Gunnison Basin and it is solely folk or mainly focused on uh, one species. And the idea for this is it's looking at the landscape through the eyes or through the scale of a population and individuals of certain bird species. So uh, in doing this, you're able to find more local data um, within the area that you're in. So if you take management practices from the front range, um, and try to apply them, you know, here to the Gunnison Basin, they may not work. So um, the idea of this is is really to show these local issues and um, and paint a picture more of uh, the local landscape and how um, how animals are interacting with it rather than um, taking management from somewhere else. So what do I want to know? Um, the main questions for my research is what's the population density of brewer sparrows across the Gunnison Basin? What factors influence its variability across the landscape? 
And how do these factors influence distribution of other sagebrush obligate birds across the basin? So these are, this is my survey uh, sites, or these are my survey sites. Um, there are 20 sites across the Gunnison Basin, um, and they are selected uh, mainly for sagebrush habitats. So back in 2018, um, the BLM and uh, Western Colorado University, or Pat, um, helped, uh, wanted, wanted more of a uh, robust um, long-term monitoring um, of sagebrush birds within the Gunnison Basin because prior to 2018 there wasn't there wasn't too much other than anecdotal data so um, so in 2018 we decided with the Bird Conservancy of the Rockies to establish a protocol for um, establishing these transect sites all across the Gunnison Basin um, and based mainly around sagebrush habitat uh, and a little closer look at what these survey sites look like um, they're four by four grid um, and they are done with point counts, which um, this next slide is a very detailed diagram of what a point count is. Um, so uh, for those who don't know for what point counts are, um, point counts are, uh, are useful for estimating population sizes um, of birds within an area. So uh, the idea is that the um, surveyor goes to one of these sites and will count uh, every species that it can hear and C, identify the species um, and then count how many individuals of that species um, they can hear and see. Uh, and then they'll be able to, um, to estimate the distance um, to that species. And so in doing so, um, you're able to get population estimate sizes. Um, so that was the quick crash, crash course in point counts. And then here's a quick crash course in distance sampling. So the way to estimate populations is um, doing an analysis called distance sampling. Um, and this is overall estimating population size. So the idea is when you go out and count these species, um, you're not going to see every single um, every single bird out there. Some are going to be hunkered down, whereas others are going to be nesting on. Uh, yeah, nesting. Um, some of them may not be singing that day for whatever reason. But yeah, so you're not going to have, you're not going to see every single species. And so what distance sampling does is it's trying to estimate populations based on the species that you do see, but also um, filling in for the gap um, for species that you don't detect. So um, over here on the left uh, of the diagram, it's uh, distance. So that's the closest distance to you. Um, and then the y-axis is the detection probability. So detection probability is high when it's closer to you because um, ideally you'll see a bird that's like five feet from you as opposed to a hundred yards. Um, and then uh, the further the distance away, um, the less likely you're to detect it. So um, this is what distance sampling does. And um, with this, you're able to come up with graphs like this. So this is one of the, um, this is one of the preliminary. And just to preface this, um, these are two analyses of probably about seven or eight analyses that I'll be end up doing for this project. Um, so this is still a project in process, uh, research in process, but um, this is a cool diagram that uh, came up with uh, the different colors are the different transects across the Gunnison Basin. It is almost all 20 transects except for three that did not have enough data um, for brewer sparrows. Um, so there are some plots across the landscape that just weren't ideal for brewer sparrow habitat. So, um, but yeah, so this is showing population estimates um, between each year. Um, and it may seem kind of just like a jumble of lines and stuff, but um, I'm gonna attempt to point out um, what I'm seeing kind of with this data. Um, so 2018, 2019, there's a whole bunch of variation. Uh, there are a lot of places that didn't, did, that didn't get surveyed maybe in 2018 that got surveyed in 2019 or vice versa. Um, but 2019 to 2020, you can kind of see a trend of, um, of an increase in population sizes. Um, and then same from 2020 to 2022, there's a slow decrease uh, in population. And then 2022 to 2023 kind of uh, varies, but there are some increases, some de decreases, but, uh, and then some that kind of stay the same. But the cool thing about this is these are plots across the Gunnison Basin, and you're able to see these similarities and fluctuations of populations um, 
whether they're in one side of the basin as opposed to the other. So uh, there's something that's influencing these uh, and that will be further determined when I uh, potentially do climatic data um, analysis. So yeah, one of the big, one of the big uh, questions I wanted to see was how does vegetation height affect distribution? So the idea was that brewer sparrows were really sensitive to habitat height or habitat factors such as vegetation height, um, thinking that taller shrubs or even uh, trees could influence uh, their distribution, whether they um, are closer to it or further away from it. And so uh, the way to do this is LIDAR, which we've heard about a couple of times. Um, and it is a really cool remote sensing technique that allows you to see a uh, vegetation structure on a fine scale without having to go out in the sagebrush and measure it yourself. Not that that's bad. You did that, that's fine. Um, but <laughs> means I don't have to go out to each one of these uh, 300 and something points um, to go measure this. So uh, you're, uh, yeah, it's, it's giving you the ability to work on, um, to look at vegetation on this detailed scale. So um, from the LIDAR data I can see here, um, it's really cool because, you know, there's this red, red mark right here that's showing higher um, higher vegetation. And that's kind of telling me that there's probably a, um, a stream that goes through there that has higher shrubs and potential tree species around it. So, um, and then you see up in this right-hand corner, a lot of um, kind of red dispersed that could probably, that's probably, and I'm pretty sure if I remember correctly, a uh, conifer stand. So um, really seeing these finer details. Um, and so I'm able to to combine the LIDAR data with the bird point count data and come up with these very nondescript um, graphs. So uh, this, these are actually two graphs that I chose um, from, from the graphs that I, or from the plots that I did. So these are two plots, this is GR15 and GR13. Um, and these were two plots that, be, that gave significant results. So significant results, meaning that birds did um, select areas based on habitat or uh, vegetation height. Um, differences, they are going different ways. So for GR15, um, the vegetation, average vegetation height within 100 meters, as it got taller, um, there were less number of individuals, brewer sparrows. Um, whereas on the right side, um, as the vegetation height got taller, there were more individuals. Um, something to note though, that they are at different scales. So this is 0 0.02 meters to 0 0.06 meters. And that's 0.2 meters to 0.6 meters. So um, probably a lot of bare ground in this plot. Um, but that being said, um, this kind of leads way to um, what we can what we can conclude from vegetation height um, and the bird distribution. Um, so a lot of the data did correlate with um, with vegetation height and bird distribution, um, and that differentiates to from plot to plot. Um, and, uh, that's potentially because, uh, there are other factors that need to be, um, need to be looked at such as, um, distance from, you know, high or er, slope, uh, elevation distance from, you know, riparian habitats, these habitats that make, um, make these higher vegetation areas, but, um, yeah, more data is still being processed to confirm this. Um, so next steps will just be um, analyze other spatial data, including uh, percent shrub cover, percent shrub composition, retrieve climatic data to try to see if there's some relation to the fluctuations in um, brewer sparrow uh, um, population numbers, and then analyze other sagebrush obligate bird species and compare them to the brewer sparrow to see if there's um, some similarity um, or difference. With that, uh, I'd like to just acknowledge for what you've done and will continue to do because this is very much so an ongoing process. Um, my advisor, Pat McGee, committee members, Kathy Broadhead, and Madeline, Madeline Vandekirk, um, and then the BCR crew, uh, organizations and funding sources. Awesome. Let's see what questions roll in for Caleb. So, after the 2020 BLM protests, AOU decided to change all uh, names so birds aren't named after problematic um, historical people. Suggestions for a new name? Oh, man. 
I have I been thinking about this. So yeah, uh, so if you don't know the context, what she's talking about is um, there was a general decision to rename uh, all bird species that were named after uh, after people just in general. So a lot of bird species were being renamed because of the people that they were named after were not the best people. Um, so uh, they decided to just wipe the board and be like, we'll rename every bird who's named after a person. So the Brewer Sparrow being one of those birds, um, I have thought about this in depth and I will have to get back to you. I'll probably, I'll put a blog post or something, or maybe I'll put it up on the, I don't know. I, I've got to, I've got to think hard and yeah, hard about this, but um, I, there's already a bird called the Sage Rose Sparrow, so I can't use that. Um, the long song sparrow, I think was like the best I could think of because of the long song. So yeah, that's, yeah. Sounds like another paper. Yeah. Another paper. Another <laughs> paper. Awesome. Um, for point counts, do you count the same bird from a different location or do you ignore it? Yes. So, uh, good question. Um, so the idea with point counts is that the person conducting the point counts has been trained enough to be able to identify um, separate individuals within uh, within each. So, so I, I didn't explain this, um, and maybe I should have, but each point is 250 meters apart from each other. And so ideally, you're not seeing the same bird between points, that, but Technically, that's always a possibility, um, especially once you're moving from one point to another, there's such a thing as kind of hurting the bird in that direction. Um, so ideally, a uh, really strong and um, really, I guess, practiced uh, surveyor will be able to identify separate individuals, um, whereas they'll be able to, you know, hear one over here, but also see something move over here to over here and then identify that potentially as the same same uh, individual. So when we record the species, uh, or at least, yeah, when I record the species, I tend to, if I think it may be the same individual, I will, um, I won't count it. Great. So another question along the very same lines. Mm -hmm. uh, this person says, thanks for the crash course on point data. You're welcome. <laughs> Are data collectors using this method trained to identify specific species? And how do you account for human error? So specific species um meaning what was the first part of that question sorry yeah so are data collectors using the method trained to identify specific species like I, could you identify all of the species that might live in sagebrush or just a handful yeah yeah cool yeah um so yeah so for my protocol specifically it's identifying all species um that i can hear see and or touch not touch but yeah you get what i mean um <laughs> But um, I actually worked on a project down in Florida where we were only identifying two specific species. That was the Florida grasshopper sparrow and the Bachman sparrow, which won't be the Bachman sparrow. But um, but yeah, so you can use it to identify other uh, very specific species, especially if your research is geared towards that species specifically. Um, and then the second part of that question. How do you account for human error? How do you account for human error? So um, I believe the statistical analysis uh, does takes care of that. So um, the, the analysis that we run on it, um, the distance sampling will uh, potentially account for, and, and that's part of the it estimating, you know, how many, um, uh, how, how many individuals we don't see. Um, yeah. And then the, the other, you know, caveat of that is, the idea is to get these people trained um, that are actually conducting the survey. So the BCR puts on a training for all of its techs because they have plots all throughout Colorado and Utah, Wyoming, um, where their technicians will go out and conduct these surveys. And so they have training um, throughout the season to help make sure that um, that error is mitigated as much as possible. Next question. Did you see any impact from Highway 50 construction in your data? And do you think the issue with Middle Bridge will impact the distribution of bird species? Good question. So actually, um, it's it is so my plots do not go as far over to Highway 50 construction. Um, they end. Where did I put it? They end. Let me see. There it is. Yeah. So they end um, right 
actually the furthest west i believe is right close to where the um where the bridge crosses that is broken down now um but yeah so it is far i would assume it's far enough back so it's it's that's the dylan pinnacles re recreation area um and that's that little you know valley is right where one of my plots is um and i wouldn't I wouldn't think that would be the only plot that would potentially be impacted by it. Um, a lot of these plots are very remote, uh, see very little, you know, impact. Um, something anecdotal about that is that uh, I'm always looking for cheatgrass on my plots because um, cheatgrass is mainly in these disturbed areas alongside highways, whereas my plots are out in the middle of nowhere. So um, people are people aren't seeing these plots, and personally, I don't see cheatgrass too many places but um that being said um yeah i i don't know it depends on how loud they're what they're doing to the bridge how loud it is but i i, I think it's far enough away to where there would be no impact for um any any of the plots last <laughs> yeah oh crap <laughs> have to airdrop you i wasn't thinking about that yeah, so that's this. Uh, oh crap! Yeah, that's this. <laughs> that's uh, all of those. Yeah. Nope. Oh, nope. Nope. <laughs> there we go. So that's this plot right here. Um, there's a after the bridge. There's a road. I forgot what road it is, but it's the road that they like. They've put people around. Um, that I have to to get to that plot. So. <laughs> I wasn't even thinking about that. Crap. Walk. <laughs> I'll just swim across. Okay. So now we will thank Caleb again. Okay. And now let's move to panel wide questions. Please get those submitted if you have any for the, our entire panel. We still have more bird questions coming in. Nice. <laughs> I like birds, so bring them in. Um, would you scale up your analysis to include other sagebrush birds, or you'll stay focused on this species because of its threatened status? So um, the idea towards the end of this, so um, I'm collecting bird data on every single species I see out in the sagebrush. So that includes like the three, four, or five other um, sagebrush obligate birds. So sage thrashers, green-tailed towhees, uh, vesper sparrows, sagebrush sparrows. Um, I'm collecting data on this. So my my species of focus is the brewer sparrow, um, and, but um, I'm hoping to conduct analyses um, with the other species just to see um, how they compare with the brewer sparrow. Um, yeah. Question for Liam. Do you think your findings about the BLM aim inadequacies may impact their methods? I would say that I'm a small fish in a big pond. Um, I would hope so, though. It really, it, it, it it's tricky because we want to measure characteristics of the land that are meaningful for the preservation of, of sage-grouse habitat. Um, that being said, we know that uh, grass is a small component of the cover that's providing them uh, the way that they make their living. Um, you would have thought that uh, any statistician looking at that method, since it's been used over the last uh, 15 years, that um, you know you would have read it and said, "Oh, they're not randomly sampling." You know, so I, I kind of felt. Um, like I couldn't be the first one to to realize this, um, and I don't know if I am, but I I think if if we spread the word wide enough, I think it could be listened to. It's a really easy thing to fix. Yeah. Great. And another question for Liam: Do you think you'd see more pronounced grazing effects if you monitored your transects over time? Something like erosion impacting vegetation composition. Yeah, uh, that's that's great. Um, this project will continue. 
Uh, we have a graduate student here who's taking my place, uh, Jenna Tansel, your student. Um, she She's uh, wonderful and she's gonna be continuing this monitoring over the next three years. And it's likely gonna continue after that as long as uh, federal agencies are willing to put money into it. It's, it's a lot of time in the field. Uh, there's maybe better ways to do it with remote sensing rather than, um, than being on the ground, like you said. Um, but I would say in terms of erosion, uh, we do see it in those riparian habitats. It's a lot less common in the sagebrush uplands. Um, but, you know, we focused our, uh, our efforts in sagebrush uplands because that's where uh, the majority of the literature is saying this conflict between uh, livestock and sage grouse is occurring. It's in the nesting habitats in the nesting phase of the sage grouse life cycle. Um, and so once we start looking closer at riparian areas, we are going to see um, effects of erosion. Yeah. Next question is for Tim. How do you measure beetle kill heterogeneity? Yeah, great question. Um, so I, for each individual pixel, we have 30 meter by 30 meter pixels. And I create a buffer around each of those pixels. Uh, and part of the analysis I didn't talk about is we looked at several different buffer sizes ranging from 30 meters, so all the adjacent pixels to one kilometer. And then within whatever those buffers are, we calculate the standard deviation of all the pixels that are encompassed by that. And so that becomes a metric of the heterogeneity of how different that specific pixel is to you know, all the surrounding pixels within that buffer and calculate that across the entire study area, which is fun and computationally intensive. <laughs> Great. So here's a question for the whole panel. Is there a fun fact or something surprising that you found during your research or analyses? It's a great question. My fun fact was that as you, I flashed my graph really quickly, but I only found like evidence of the settlement horizon in three of my 18 study ecoregions. And I don't know why that is. And so that's something I'm looking into more. That was a tough question. Um, no, I don't know. I just, I think, so I'm not, you know, originally from Colorado, the West. So beetle kill was a new, new concept to me. Uh, when I got here and I think just becoming intimately familiar with its impacts on, on the region, um, has been, been super enlightening. Yeah. I feel like mine is pretty, it's kind of like broader scale, like yours, Tim, but, um, I want to be a herpetologist when I grow up. So I think it's been really fascinating for me to learn about the climatic variables that I think are going to be important to at least boreal toads. And I mean, they're all amphibians, so they might be likely um, uh, useful for, for the other two. But um, I think it's been really cool to figure out, like, obviously humidity is a big deal for amphibians, but that's not something that I came to grad school with, you know, with that knowledge. Um, so uh, I think that's learning that has been really fun for me. Um, a fun fact, I guess, is, uh, over the course of three years of field work is, uh, I was walking around a lot and looking really closely at the ground and I found five or six full fledged, uh, arrowhead points from the people that were here before us and lots of other lithic scatter, uh, from where folks were making tools. Uh, so that was really humbling and exciting. And I left them there and I can, proudly say that I can return to those locations and still find those points. So that's pretty, pretty fun. Mm. <laughs> I guess a fun fact is how good you smell after walking through sagebrush. It's it smells really nice. Um, yeah. Oh, sorry. Uh, on a more scientific note though. Um, it, it, it's cool to see. So I did uh, I did a lot of field work in Florida um, and prairie land in Florida, which not a lot of people know that there's prairies down there. Um, but uh, it was cool to see the similar behaviors between sagebrush birds and Florida prairie birds, um, just because there's it's completely different environments. Um, but just because they have uh, kind of a similar, I guess, vegetative structure, um, there's the similarity between two completely different areas. Um, and yeah, that's kind of cool to compare. Cool. So another panel for the, or another question for the full panel. 
most of you collected your data within the Gunnison Basin or very close to it. Do you think your research is applicable at a broader scale? Yeah, okay, so <laughs> I'll start off with that. Um, yeah, so I had mentioned before how how it, it's really nice to have this more local scale um, local scale research to be able to have management more effective on the land around us. Um, not not saying that these management actions couldn't be applied to somewhere else or other places, other management actions, other places couldn't be applied to here. So um, I do feel like th there's plenty of other sagebrush um, steps across the American West um, that uh, I believe brewer sparrows probably um, react to vegetation pretty similarly. So, um, yeah. Um, yeah, I would say, uh with with my focus yes um there's the blm component of how they're measuring structure which um we think could be improved um and there's also you know gunnison sage grouse are a small scale model um that could be applied to all of greater sage grouse range which occurs in uh, something like 13 western states so um that's the interesting thing about gunnison sage grouse uh, being listed as a threatened species here in Gunnison on the Endangered Species Act is, um, you know, a lot of folks look at that and wonder if it's going to apply to a much larger, larger uh, area with the greater sage grouse. So, uh, kind of yet to be seen. But. So, um, while I did not collect my data in the Gunnison Basin, I collected mine on my computer. Um, I think that we can kind of use that that the fact that we're using three different amphibians in an in a high alpine area to kind of add to the growing literature that there are a lot of species that are losing habitat and given their high high alpine species and that's already kind of a threatened area a threatened eco ecosystem it'll be interesting to see by using those three to paint the bigger picture of that uh loss of like critical habitat so i think it's um a part of a larger picture. Yeah, for mine, I would say I would caution in against extrapolating outside the study area just uh, for several reasons. Well, I guess I'll first say that I think the methods can be applied uh, pretty much anywhere, but in terms of like mapping the beetle kill severity, you know, that depends largely on the tree species and the composition of the forest, uh, and then also the like the natural ecology of the animals. Um, so like while I think there may be some transferability to other regions that have been impacted by beetle kill. I think the more useful takeaway is that these methods uh, are applicable everywhere. All this data is pretty widely available. You know, all the Landsat data freely accessible. Um, other state and federal agencies are doing collaring projects, so that uh, animal location data is also available. So I think more useful on a broader scale is is the methods employed. My um, a major purpose of mine was to test whether my research was applicable at a broad scale, and the answer is yes. However, it is true that even though it does work broadly, there might be better results at a more fine scale, and so there's definitely pros and cons to expanding your study area versus keeping it more local. Well, I think that's all the time we have question or all the questions we have time for today. Man, I need a cookie. <laughs> <laughs> Let's thank our panel again. All right. Thank you all for joining us on this first day of our community forum. And we'll see you back here tomorrow morning.